So, uh, thank the organizers for uh, uh, for the invitation and giving me the chance to uh, to participate and uh, learn from all of you here. Uh, I am an immunologist and. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background uh, as to where we come from, and that needs to be switched, but I should be connected. I was before, just fine. Shall I close? Just send the image. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the relationship between the microbiota and the uh, immune system. Uh, and uh, give you some examples of homeostatic interactions and uh, what we think may occur in uh, states of disease. Um, and David Relman showed a, the entire painting earlier, but years ago when I was in the Prado, I found that Hieronymus Bosch painting and found this little fragment of it where this person is analyzing a model uh, animal system. And, uh, <laughs> uh, David, if you look carefully, I think you'll find that somewhere in the middle of the painting. Uh, and so we've been uh, studying for a long time the experimental mouse to try to give us uh, insights into human physiology uh, and been focusing in particular uh, on uh, uh, different types of T lymphocytes uh, in the immune system and uh, more recently at mucosal surfaces. Uh, so this is just a very general uh, review of uh, some of the more important immune cell types uh, at the mucosal bo border in the gut. Uh, we know that there are signals that are transmitted through different types of dendritic cells that can influence the balance of potentially pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cells. The anti-inflammatory cells are regulatory T cells that express FOXP3. Uh, the pro-inflammatory cells can be Th1 or Th17 cells. I have the Th17 cells listed here, which are particularly abundant uh, in the lamina propria. Then there are also innate lymphoid cells that um, make very similar types of cytokines uh, as the uh, different types of T cells. Um, and uh, all of these uh, uh, function together uh, normally to protect the, uh, uh, the uh, barrier uh, and uh, in large part through production of uh, uh, antimicrobial peptides that can regulate the levels uh, of the commensal microbiota as well as potentially uh, any potential pathogens. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just very briefly tell you about uh, how we think different modes of interaction of microbiota with the host immune system uh, can occur. So we believe there are certain bacteria uh, such as the segmented filamentous bacteria that I showed you an EM of uh, at the outset, uh, that can homeostatically induce cells of the immune system, uh, presumably for beneficial purpose, uh, both to the microbiota uh, as well as uh, uh, hopefully to the host. Um, and I'll show you a, an example of this uh, through T helper 17 cells, but there are other examples uh, very likely in, uh, in the case of regulatory T cells. And maybe Sarkis Masmanian will tell us a little bit uh, about uh, uh, B. fragilis and its role in uh, regulatory functions. But then we also think there, are, there is a process of homeostatic inhibition of the activation of the immune system in which microbiota can signal uh, to prevent uh, the activation uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, effector responses uh, at inductive sites. Uh, and in the absence of this kind of inhibitory signal uh, that presumably uh, puts a stop signal to certain cells of the immune system, such as dendritic cells, these would now become released, taking up uh, components of the microbiota and leaving, leading to an inflammatory induction of immune responses, and maybe something like this could be going on in some of the IBDs. So uh, we have uh, certain examples, and I'll just cite a couple from our own laboratory, of how the uh, immune system is compartmentalized from the microbiota. So one of this is this avoidance of microbe elicited immune responses in which a particular type of myeloid cell that expresses the chemokine receptor CX3CR1 seems to be particularly important uh, in preventing, uh, uh, in, av in avoiding activation of immune responses. So these cells seem to be inhibited by MITE88-regulated microbial signals 
to, uh, uh, from migrating to inductive sites, such as the, uh, uh, the mesenteric lymph nodes. So that is a kind of a functional uh, uh, compartmentalization. Then there, uh, uh, there's another kind of compartmentalization that's enforced by regulatory T cells, uh, recruitment of Tregs uh, to the, uh, the lamina propria. And then another mechanism is this selective microspecific immune response that I mentioned. Uh, we know from work uh, of Kenya Honda uh, that there can be uh, regulatory T cell expansion in response to certain clostridia. Uh, and then uh, Chi Shea's group in St. Louis, uh, Lathrop et al. paper a couple of years ago, showed that there can be microspecific regulatory T cells, although their specificity was not demonstrated. And I'm going to tell you about uh, segmentofilamentous bacteria-mediated induction of antigen-specific T helper 17 cells. So just an example of this uh, uh, compartmentalization by negative signals, uh, Gretchen Deal in our laboratory uh, found very surprisingly that when mice are treated with antibiotics and then uh, given bacteria like uh, a, uh, a non-invasive salmonella, or in this case just E. coli, uh, K12, and then looked at E. coli titers in this case, as well as an IgA antibody response in the feces. Surprisingly, after antibiotic treatment, there was now E. coli in the mesenteric nodes, as well as the induction of a E. coli-specific IgA response. And uh, uh, in, in, in brief, what we think happens is that the microbiota give this kind of a negative signal uh, through MIT88, uh, through presumably through toll-like receptors, uh, keeping these CX3CR1 positive mononuclear phagocytes uh, in the uh, attached to the lamin uh, to the epithelium in the lamina propria, uh, and in the absence of this signal, uh, there's a CCR7 mediated migration of these cells. These cells basically become untethered; they pick up bacterial content and they transport uh, actually full bacteria that we can now culture from the mesenteric nodes. Uh, they uh, transport these through the afferent lymphatics where they can induce both a T cell response and an antibody IgA response. And we'd like to propose that a dysregulation of this kind of a process uh, in a dysbiotic gut uh, may result in inflammation through this kind of a mechanism. So this is just one example. Um, and uh, 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 Sangwon Kim, uh, has been doing work on regulatory T cell recruitment to the uh, lamina propria, and he found that a uh, orphan uh, G protein coupled receptor, GPR15, uh, that's expressed preferentially on regulatory T cells uh, is involved in the migration uh, of these cells to uh, the large intestine lamina propria, uh, where we think that these promote homeostasis. So I'll now tell you a bit about selective microbe specific immune responses. So a few years ago, uh, Ivo Ivanov in our laboratory uh, found that uh, uh, animals from Jackson Lab versus uh, Taconic, uh, uh, the Taconic Farms uh, 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 providers of, uh, 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 of mice uh, differed in the level of Th17 cells, and he found that uh, uh, that was because of the uh, absence uh, versus the presence of uh, segmented filamentous bacterium showed here uh, attaching to the ileum. Now this, is, uh, this was present only in the taconic uh, black six mice here and not in the Jackson mice. And uh, these, just to remind you, these are gram-positive uh, anaerobes uh, that are spore-forming. They have yet to be cultured, and they most closely resemble Clostridia, but they're still very, very different uh, from typical Clostridia, and they have a very uh, reduced uh, genome size. Um, and uh, we collaborated with Kenya Honda and uh, 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 Yoshi Umesaki's group uh, in Japan because they were able to provide us with mono-associated feces uh, uh, from mice colonized just with SFB. So when these were provided to germ-free mice, within a week to 10 days, we could now see the induction of T cells, CD4 T cells, that make both interleukin-22 and interleukin-17. So you can see this induction uh, occurring over here. So that proved really that SFB itself is the inducer of Th17 cells. So how does this now influence uh, 
uh, Th17 mediated processes. We know that Th17 cells are involved in a number of uh, uh, autoimmune diseases and other inflammatory processes. Uh, and can, also, can this also be beneficial? And this is just showing a couple of examples. So in colonization of animals with Citrobacter, uh, and Citrobacter uh, 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 will grow primarily in the, in the colon, you can see that animals that have SFB uh, are relatively protected uh, from the, uh, the growth of Citrobacter in the colon. On the other hand, as uh, shown here uh, with Diane Mathis and Christophe Benoit in a uh, arthritis, spontaneous arthritis model uh, that they have developed, uh, you can see that germ-free mice uh, basically do not get arthritis, and animals that have now been uh, given SFB within days begin to develop uh, the, uh, the arthritis, and this is a TH17 mediated process uh, it's uh, absolutely dependent on T helper 17 cells, and uh, Sarkis has shown in a different model, in the EAE model, something very similar, that uh, SFB uh, uh, greatly exacerbates uh, the disease process uh, in EAE. So that indicates then that TH17 cells that are induced locally in the gut can contribute somehow uh, at uh, uh, a systemic level uh, to autoimmune disease and potentially can also contribute at a systemic level to protective uh, processes because SFB uh, is present in the, in the small intestine and uh, may induce a protective response also for the colon. Uh, but that is something that still needs to be studied. So how do SFB elicited TH17 cells then provide specific protection or exert uh, pathogenic functions? Uh, so there are several questions we can ask uh, uh, within this larger question here. And one is, what is the antigen specificity of the SFB-elicited Th17 cells? And we can think of several possibilities. One is that uh, these cells are nonspecific, so that any T cell in an SFB-conditioned microenvironment could become a T helper 17 cell. Uh, alternatively, these could be uh, cells that are particularly reactive to self-antigen, but the SFB-dependent microenvironment may sensitize these, may actually lower the threshold for their uh, activation uh, as autoreactive Th17 cells, or alternatively, uh, this microenvironment may curb regulatory T cell-mediated tolerance. And the third possibility is that these T cells are specific for SFB or other commensal uh, uh, antigens. Uh, and I'll tell you about some of the experiments we did to, to look at this. Another question which we have not addressed is, do SFB-induced T helper 17 cells circulate to lymphoid tissues that are draining the specific organs involved in uh, autoimmunity? And if so, how do these circulate out of the gut, out of the inductive site, uh, to go to, uh, say, uh, uh, tissues that drain the CNS, synovium for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or the skin in, for example, psoriasis? Okay, so in order to do this, we decided to look at the repertoire of the Th17 cells in the gut. This is work that Benny Yang in our laboratory did. And we were very fortunate to get mice made by Mohamed Uka and Vijay Kuchru, in which the green fluorescent protein was knocked into the IL-23 receptor locus. So the wonderful thing about this tool is that all Th17 cells express GFP now. Uh, and uh, so we can look at GFP positive Th17 cells and at GFP negative non-Th17 cells and, uh, and look at various uh, 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 T cell receptor uh, subunits on the surface, in this case, V-beta-14. And I show V-beta-14 in particular because you see here that there is a prevalence of V-beta-14 positive cells among Th17 cells compared to non-Th17 cells. So looking at many animals here, you can see that it's roughly a three to one preference for Th17 uh, in this particular type of T cell, whereas V-beta-6 cells you can see are at a one to one ratio. Initially, we thought this might be due to some kind of a superantigen, but upon uh, much more work, we we've, uh, l figured that this indeed has something to do with a uh, predisposition of this uh, subset of T cell receptors for antigens on SFB, as I will show you. So the way that we learned this, and this is work done by Benny with help from Miriam Torchinsky, uh, was to take a reporter T cell hybridoma that reports on activation through the T cell receptor by expressing GFP driven by NFAT. So when these cells have an introduced T cell receptor along with co-receptor CD4, if they can be activated as a control with anti-T cell receptor antibody, 
uh, or with antigen-presenting cells and colonic contents, we can look for the presence or absence of GFP induction. And uh, so we introduce then into these cells uh, various uh, pairs of alpha-beta T-cell receptors that are cloned from individual T-cells that were either GFP plus or minus uh, in the colon, either TH17 plus uh, or non-TH17 cells. And something very surprising to me, at least, uh, uh, happened when we looked at this. First of all, the non-TH17 cell T-cell receptors did not respond at all, or responded very poorly here, to colonic content. But the TH17 cell receptors, you can see almost all of them respond, and some very, very strongly, only in this case to SFB mono-associated uh, fecal content. Uh, and this then uh, allowed us to look in more detail here at, uh, at activation of T cells. There were either uh, uh, GFP positive TH17 or non TH17. And you can see essentially all the V beta 14 positive cells in the gut, uh, if they are uh, TH17, now respond to SFB containing microbiota. Uh, whereas the uh, non-TH17 cells do not respond. But this is not restricted to V-beta-14. You see V-beta-8 cells, also a large proportion of these cells respond. Uh, also in V-beta-6 cells, as shown here. So this is just showing non-V-beta-14 cells uh, responding as well. But only the TH17 cells are responding. So this is really telling us there's something about SFB that elicits uh, a uh, T helper 17 response and not other types of, uh, of T cells. So to really uh, nail this, try to uh, uh, narrow this down a bit more, uh, we then did shotgun uh, cloning of the SFB genome uh, into, uh, uh, into E. coli and uh, looked to see whether there were colonies that could stimulate uh, these T cell reported hybridomas in the presence of uh, syngeneic uh, uh, splenocytes. And what you see here, for example, is a negative well where you see CD3 cells that are not activated. And this is a positive well here in which GFP is being turned on. And that allowed us to show that among this 11 or so T cell receptor hybridomas, uh, they fell about half and half into two different categories. Again, these are just V-beta-14 hybridomas, but they recognize two different proteins. One, a very large protein that we uh, predict to be extracellular, uh, that is, is expressed at a fairly high level within SFB in the gut of the mouse. Uh, and one, it's a smaller protein, also thought to be extracellular, that's expressed at a much lower level. Uh, but yet there are a lot of T cells uh, specific for this. So that then gave us some tools that we could make, uh, one of which was to make a T cell receptor transgenic mouse with one of these receptors that was specific for this more prevalent uh, uh, protein. And this is uh, 30, uh, the 3340 uh, uh, protein here. Uh, so what we could do is basically inject uh, these T cell receptor uh, uh, transgenic cells uh, into a mouse that either is given SFB or is not, and then we can look at the lamina propria T cells or mesenteric uh, nodes at various times uh, after transfer. And one of the things that we found right away is that when we do this kind of a transfer, we see expansion of these uh, SFB-specific T cells only in SFB-colonized animals. So you can see these are uh, uh, donor-derived cells, these are host-derived cells, and we see this expansion in the lamina propria of the small intestine only in the SFB plus mice and not in the SFB negative mice. Um, and if we now uh, uh, look at, uh, in this case, we looked with just very small numbers of cells that are injected uh, that, are now, uh, that are now expanding there, and we can look at, diff with, uh, at uh, also different times, uh, what we see is that essentially all the donor-derived cells become ROR gamma T positive cells, which is a mark uh, transcription factor that marks the TH17 cells, whereas in the uh, uh, host-derived cells, uh, typically about uh, 20 to 30 percent of the cells uh, will be uh, TH17 cells, ROR gamma T uh, positive cells. So the reactivity to SFB uh, makes these cells become TH17 cells. This is looking at multiple animals, uh, and you can see always this kind of a uh, distribution which the T cell receptor uh, uh, transgenic derived cells all become T helper 17 cells. Um, 
And we developed another tool in uh, uh, collaboration with Mark Jenkins, which, which was to make a tetramer because we mapped the uh, peptides that are being recognized uh, uh, within the, for example, the 3340 protein uh, that are being recognized with MHC IAFB by the T cell receptors. And these tetramers now allow us to stain uh, unmanipulated animals uh, for the uh, uh, presence of T cells specific for this antigen. And you see now when we look in the lamina propria at ROR gamma T positive cells and negative cells down here and tetramer positive cells, you see essentially all the tetramer positive cells are in the ROR gamma T positive TH17 compartment, uh, whereas uh, we see here in the negative uh, uh, ROR gamma T negative compartment, uh, uh, typically, we do see some, of, of course, some Th17 cells that are have other specificities, uh, obviously. Uh, so when we do this again in multiple animals, we see again the 20 to 30 percent distribution of raw gamma T positive cells in the tetramer negative cells, and more than 90 percent in the tetramer positive cells. So. <clears throat> Surprisingly then, when we ask what is the antigen specificity of SFB elicited TH17 cells, we find that they are, these are SFB specific uh, by and large, and maybe uh, in other cases there could, there could be specificities for other commensals. That does not rule out that these other uh, mechanisms may not be involved. And in fact, if we look in colon, I don't show you the data here, we find that there are very few uh, TH17 cells in colon uh, in animals that have this tetramer positive uh, kind of specificity. So there may be uh, different mechanisms, perhaps some kind of a, uh, uh, there could be environmental uh, related uh, 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 induction of TH17 cells as well. Uh, so that really remains to, uh, to be figured out. So uh, let me move on here quickly because I want to make sure I have time for uh, uh, for some relevant questions here. So what we think then is that there may be a specific niches where uh, particular types of antigen presenting cells will bring uh, 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 microbial antigens to the inductive site, in this case, say, a mesenteric lymph node, where there will be induction, for example, of Tregs if we start with Clostridia here. And if SFB are stimulating maybe a different type of niche where a different antigen presenting t a cell uh, would uh, would be present uh, that would now induce, that make the types of cytokines that would induce TH17 cells. By using the TCR transgenic mice, we find that this induction occurs first in the mesenteric lymph node around day one to three. And what then would happen is presumably these cells would redistribute by turning on homing receptors. And after day four, we see them scattered through the lamina propria. Uh, and uh, with Tregs, induction of GPR15 at least, would lead to these cells going to the large intestine in large number, where we find them in the largest numbers. Uh, and then what happens in autoimmunity? Well, one possibility is that these cells are redirected aberrantly to either to joints, for example, for arthritis, uh, or, to, uh, uh, or to lymphoid tissues that are draining uh, these sites. And for some reason, uh, these would, either through cross-reactivity or through uh, near neighbor kind of functions, uh, would induce uh, disease at these sites. So of course, then, we wanted to look at Th17 cells in human disease. And I won't uh, belabor this point, but we know that many autoimmune diseases in human and asthma, uh, steroid-resistant asthma, are associated with uh, Th17 cells. So Jose Scher, who is a rheumatology fellow at NYU, along with Steve Abramson, uh, who is now our chair of medicine, but he was uh, uh, head of rheumatology, uh, joined us in looking at commensal uh, 16S uh, in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And we collaborated with Carlos Ubeda and Eric Pamer initially to do the 16S analysis. And we we're very fortunate that we had access to new onset RA patients at Bellevue Hospital, but we also had chronic RA patients and psoriatic arthritis along with healthy control. And what came out immediately that was really striking is that only in these new onset RA patients, the Nora patients, there was a very high abundance of a Prevotella uh, in, these, uh, uh, in the feces of these patients. Uh, whereas in the healthies, in the chronic RA and psoriatic RA, we saw only 15 to 20 percent of these with high levels of Prevotella. Um, and uh, 
If we looked then more closely uh, by metagenomic sequencing, we saw something that was very similar to what was observed uh, in the uh, HMP uh, analysis. And Michael Fishbach provided me this analysis here, but Curtis, who is following uh, me in his talk, he may have one slide that shows this as well. There really is a bimodal distribution of Prevotella copri uh, in, uh, uh, in the healthy population. Typically around 15% of people have it, uh, but 85% of it do not. Uh, in our case, we see about 70% of the Nora patients who have this, and it is the most, uh, most closely related to P. copri based on the metagenomic analysis. And what we also find is that there are some sequences that we find associated with a patient sample Prevotella and others primarily with a healthy sample Prevotella, bringing up the possibility that actually there may be some, uh, 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 some virulence uh, associated uh, with this particular species uh, in the patients. Finally, we don't have any proof of causality here, but the way we've been looking is by introducing Prevotella, in this case a reference strain, P. copri, uh, into uh, mice that have been uh, first uh, treated with antibiotics. We confirm colonization, uh, and then we uh, uh, treat these mice with uh, uh, disulfate, uh, 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 sodium, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is basically an irritant, uh, and uh, uh, we can see that there is a more severe weight loss and more severe uh, uh, colonic uh, inflammation uh, as well that Randy Longman in the lab found if the animals have received Prevotella. We see something very similar also with collagen-induced arthritis. So then to close here, what we think then is that there may be different mechanisms of uh, achieving homeostasis, achieving a balance between Tregs and effector T cells by having responses to different types of, uh, of bacteria in different niches uh, within the gut, but in addition, uh, there is a way of uh, restraining uh, bacterial content uh, from uh, reaching the, uh, uh, the inductive sites. So a few questions then that we can ask right away. Are there microbiota-specific Th17 cells expanded in RA, and do they contribute to pathogenesis? We don't have an answer to this. But also another, what I think is an interesting question is, could commensals specialized for homeostatic activation of adaptive immune cells be used for protective or tolerogenic vaccination? As an example, to control early HIV-induced depletion of Th17 cells that occurs in the intestinal lamina propria. So these are just some of the questions that we're interested in, but we think that there are many outstanding questions here in the field. So in terms of what might be the microbiota influence on the immune system, and I'll just read quickly through these as I'm going a minute or two over here. Is there a subset of microbes that influence differentiation of discrete components of the immune system? So I showed you an example for uh, uh, SFB. Uh, SFB may exist in human, and I'd like to have a discussion about that later. Uh, but uh, is SFB an outlier, or are there many such bacteria like this? And this would involve induction of T cell subsets, B cells and immunoglobulins, of course, innate cells that are both lymphoid and myeloid. And do specific microbial metabolites, such as secondary bile acids, uh, influence immune cells? And we think that that is going to be the case. Uh, what sets apart these microorganisms that influence immune responses, such as the bacteria that induced Th17 cells? Are there regional differences in inductive events, uh, say Th17 cells in the small intestine versus the large intestine? And what's the role of the microbiota in the TB uh, cell functional repertoire? I showed you uh, one example here, but are there circulating B and T cells specific for antigens encoded by the microbiome? Are there associated effector functions? What's the proportion of su such cells in our circulation? Could such cells account for the repertoire of T cells and potentially B cells with effector or memory phenotypes, okay, so these are experienced cells, presumably, that are anticipatory for potential pathogens. And Mark Davis recently showed that there are anti-HIV memory T cells in people who are naive to HIV. Could these be induced by microbiota? And could there be evolutionary pressures for these kinds of microbi microbiota interactions with the host? And could individual commensals be exploited then to induce specific antimicrobial protective immune responses, such as commensal HIV vaccines I mentioned? And some other question is, what is the relationship of microbiota composition to host genetics at steady state? And we heard a little bit about this from Ruth Lay, but in particular, is there a link of MHC haplotypes 
or immune system gene polymorphisms to the composition of the microbiota. And do dysbiosis and the abundance of particular microbes contribute to diverse autoimmune diseases and other inflammatory conditions? I gave you an example of Prevotella and the association with new onset RA, but as da David Relman told us this morning, there can, you know, we don't know if there's this a cause or effect, if it's initiating or propagating. In our case, we think it's very likely it would be initiating if it is causal because we don't see it uh, in the chronic RA patients. Is it necessary and or sufficient? Uh, and can microspecific T cells and antibodies be detected at steady state uh, and in dysbiosis associated disease? And are these present systemically? I think these are all questions that we are now in a position to have the tools uh, to begin to, to answer. Uh, I've mentioned many of the people who've been involved in this work already. I want to particularly point out Nicholas Agata and Curtis Hattenhauer have helped us enormously uh, on the Prevotella work uh, uh, most recently. Uh, and, uh, uh, and these folks here have helped us a great deal uh, with the SFB. So thank you very much. Sorry for going over. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Littman. And since he already asked himself the questions and put on the slides, I think we're going to move on to the next speaker. And at the end, when we have the open floor discussion, maybe you... Um, can ask other questions. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Curtis Hattenhauer from Harvard uh, School of Public Health, and he's gonna present function, functional analysis of human microbiome, metagenomes, metatranscriptomes, and multiomics. 